Good morning, it's Dr. Calatrello. I'm coming to you live from the Purple Parrot Lounge high atop Harris Hall from the Decatur campus of Calhoun Community College. And today we get to talk about characterization. It's one of my favorite chapters in the book and it's absolutely central to um, facilitating our appreciation and our um, uh, passion and, and really helps explain so much of our love uh, of literature. So today we get to talk about the characters, the people who populate the stories that we read. So the methods by which a writer creates people in a story so that they seem actually to exist are called characterization. So that's what we're talking about this morning. Someone once asked Virginia Woolf, the British modernist novelist, about her writing strategies and about when she sat down to write a novel, whether she, whether or not she had an idea in mind or, or a theme that she was wanting to explore in her novel. And I remember her reply that I read. Her reply was uh, very insightful to me because she said, Oh, heavens no. In fact, she said, Woe be to the writer who sets out with a big idea in his or her mind. Rather, what she said that she did was she, uh, the characters came to her. And it was through the, uh, the visitation of the characters and then the imagination of what types of, uh, what types of situations these characters would find themselves in. Uh, uh, that this is what motivated her to, um, to write the novels that she did. She never started out with an idea or a theme, but rather it was principally through, through a character. And then the, uh, the associated imaginations and the wanderings of those imaginations and the peoples that these characters would meet, the situations they would find themselves in, the conflicts and so forth. And then the novel would grow organically or the story would grow organically around, uh, around these characters. So characterization, guys, is a very principal, uh, fundamental element of a good story. And uh, character development becomes more important in, in literary fiction. Formulaic, or the commercial fiction that we sometimes read, is typically less concerned with presenting authentic characters. Uh, and rather, it's more concerned with giving the reader that action-packed plot, uh, that formulaic uh, plot that we... Um, uh, that readers of formulaic fiction typically want or that they're, they're seeking out. Uh, readers of literary fiction, though, are usually more concerned with what motivates characters to act the way they do um, than the actions themselves. And your book does a good job of, uh, of touching on this. Characters can be convincing when they're presented by telling or showing, provided that their actions are motivated. And that, uh, in short, your uh, the idea is that the character's actions begin to be plausible and consistent with who they are in the situations that they find themselves in. And when you are, uh, when you are thinking this as we're reading through the stories, are these characters' actions plausible? Are they consistent? Do they seem rightly and aptly motivated? Then this is a good indicator that, um, that the characterization of the story is authentic and that what what you are reading is probably more literary than uh, than formulaic. So let's begin with direct presentation, one of the methods that authors can use for characterization. Direct presentation is, just as the name suggests, it is a direct presentation of what a character's nature is. It's when an author comes right out and tells the reader what the character is like. A couple of examples from Alice Walker's Everyday Use. If we think about the narrator um, who ref is describing herself uh, in the beginning of the story, she says, In real life, I am a large, big-boned woman with rough, man-working hands. She gives us that direct physical uh, presentation of herself. And when she is remembering her daughter, Dee, uh, she states directly to the reader, that Dee wanted nice things. At 16, she had a style of her own and knew what style was. Now, sometimes uh, this direct presentation methodology is also just simply referred to as telling, showing versus telling um, the reader what a character is like. We'll talk next about 
uh, what showing is. A second and perhaps more satisfying method of characterization is referred to as indirect presentation, sometimes referred to as showing. So with indirect presentation of a character, an author shows us characters in action. The author puts a character or characters into a scene and lets them interact. And again, this can be a far more satisfying method of characterization because it allows us as readers uh, to reach our own conclusions about the characters. Okay? Because we evaluate fictional characters much in the same way that we understand people we meet every day, right? I mean, it really does make good common sense. Uh, when we meet somebody, right, we have all had the experience of, um, uh, of maybe meeting somebody that somebody has told us something about beforehand. Oh, you won't like this person. She is so-and-so or she is such-and-such such a way. And uh, I, I certainly had that as a teacher when I was uh, in my brief and uh, non-illustrious career as a high school teacher. I sometimes had uh, fellow teachers say, oh, you won't like having this student in your class because, uh, because he never pays attention or he's talkative or he's rambunctious. And, and whenever I would uh, have a teacher do that, I would try to stop them immediately because I would much rather come to my own conclusion about a student and, uh, and form my own opinion about what the student was like because chances are that student might be very different around me than he or she was around somebody else. And so this is a far more satisfying way of figuring out what someone's like is by observing them, watching them uh, interact with other characters, watching their behavior, observing it, seeing what they do, you know, uh, evaluating their actions, listening to how they speak, how they treat one another. Uh, and so, again, your book does a nice job of pointing that out, that the way we evaluate fictional characters is really similar to the way that we evaluate the characters that we meet in our daily lives. So indirect presentation is, again, most modern readers much uh, much prefer an indirect indirect way because that's part of the satisfaction I guess of reading a story or reading a novel or watching a movie is observing the character and again by assessing or evaluating how the character is behaving how they're talking how they're treating people we can reach our own conclusions and that's again what most modern uh, what most modern readers prefer Okay, so we should have a pretty good grasp on the two principal methods of characterization. The direct presentation, uh, in other words, the telling, uh, and then the indirect presentation uh, method, which is sometimes referred to as showing. So now let's talk about uh, some various types of characters that uh, we can identify uh, in fiction. Flat characters, round characters, stock characters, static characters, and dynamic characters. In characterization, there's this concept, um, this idea of uh, a flat character. Now, a flat character is not somebody who is uh, literally flat. They are figuratively flat in the sense that they can be characterized, they can be summed up by maybe just one or two principal traits. And we might be able to generate a sentence or two about the character. Uh, think about uh, Aminadab in Nathaniel Hawthorne's uh, The Birthmark. There's not much to his character, right? He is uh, Alamer's assistant, and, and he's kind of a strange character. But he's a minor character. He doesn't play a real principal role in the story. If we think about uh, Barbara in Roman Fever, uh, that's Grace's daughter. Uh, she makes an appearance. Uh, we know who she is, but we don't really know that much about um, uh, who she is as a character. We don't get that much um, interior um, uh, interior landscape of her character revealed. Uh, again, she's a minor character. She's flat. Um, if we think about Eudora Welty's story, A Worn Path, um, the package lady who uh, shows up 
uh, who Old Phoenix meets on the way to town, uh, the nurse, uh, the hunter. These, again, are flat characters. They're minor characters. They may have uh, one or two appearances in a story. They are principally there to serve as what we call foils, F-O-I-L-S, or as my wife says, full, because she's from Texas. I like to make fun of her. Uh, but, uh, but what a foil is, is a, uh, in literature at least, a, a foil is um, a method whereby um, an author can put a character, uh, a, a main character, a protagonist, around several other flat characters. And through the interactions of these characters, we can, uh, we can see and understand the protagonist better by his or her uh, relationship and his or her interactions and proximity to other characters around them. So they serve as foils. In other words, we understand one by its, uh, uh, by its relationship to the other, okay? Uh, oftentimes by contrast. Think about when you go to the jewelry store and you're picking out a diamond ring for your wife, which I try to do every year. And, um, you know, we, you, we've all seen the little nice jewelry boxes and you open them up and they are, um, they're, they're, they're typically lined with a black, very dark, uh, felty material, right? You know what I'm talking about? And then the ring or the piece of, uh, or the earrings or whatever, uh, the, the pennant, uh, uh, these are laid against the black velvet, right? Okay, it's the same idea. That's a foil. Okay, we can see the ring, we can see the diamond better because it is against the black velvet. Okay, so sometimes flat characters in stories can function that way. So they're, they serve a purpose. They're there for a reason. But it's principally for us to understand, again, when we're getting to that indirect presentation of, of a character, right, where we want to observe them. So when we're watching the character interact with minor characters, pay attention. Because oftentimes, the protagonist character is the one characters uh, who we will see, we'll learn more about, okay? Because of his or her relationships and interactions, however brief they may be, uh, with flat characters. Okay, just uh, a few ideas about round characters. Now, round characters are the opposite of flat characters. They are generally more complex. They are more dimensional, uh, hence the term round. Uh, they uh, can have many sides to them. They're more, they're more complicated characters. They are usually the protagonist in the story. Okay, they're usually the main character. Your main characters are usually your round characters. They are the ones in the plot. Remember, we talked about plot. They are the ones who, as they go through uh, the rising action, they are the ones who are experiencing conflict. And it's through the conflict again, remember, that we begin to see characterization oftentimes revealed. Um, so the uh, around character is going to be someone like Catherine um, Mansfield's character, Miss Brill. Uh, it could be the narrator, Mama, in Everyday Use. Uh, Phoenix Jackson is a good example of a round character. Uh, so is Sorty in the, that wonderful little short story, Saving Sorty. So round characters are are more complex. Uh, they are they are many sided. They are the opposite of of flat characters. So some flat characters are uh, immediately recognizable uh, and referred to as stock characters. Okay, uh, so a stock character is a special type of flat character. They're typically uh, based or derived on stereotypes that we all will recognize. Um, we've seen them before. They, they are types of characters, right? Uh, think about the jock, the mad scientist, the absent-minded professor, the ditzy or the dizzy blonde, uh, the shrewd detective, the kind-hearted prostitute. These are stock characters. And they too, interestingly enough, serve a function, um, especially in short fiction, uh, in both, in both um, uh, primarily in uh, formulaic fiction, 
And again, the, the purpose that they often serve is that we don't have to think about them uh, too hard or for too long. Because, again, if, we are, uh, if our principal interest is in the protagonist and trying to understand his or her conflict, we need to spend more intellectual power or imaginative power connecting with that protagonist, the hero or the heroine of the story. So stock characters serve a purpose because we know who they are. We don't have to think about them. Oh, here comes the mad scientist, or here is the, uh, you know, the boozy detective, or, uh, uh, you know, here's the mad scientist doing his thing. Um, so stock characters uh, are another type of character that uh, we will experience in, uh, and again, primarily formulaic fiction, not always. You'll, you'll encounter a stock character in a, piece of, um, uh, in a piece of literary fiction from time to time. Good news, we only have two more slides left, so stay with me, okay? We're almost done. The static character. Uh, it's always funny to me. I can always tell when a student has paid attention in class or has listened to the presentations and studied and read. Because sometimes I'll ask uh, in, on an exam to explain what a static character is and maybe give an example of a static character. And I can always tell when a student hasn't studied because they will begin their response with something like this. A static character is a character who is somehow fuzzy. Uh, unclear, and I always kind of smile because they're obviously, uh, if they think of static on a radio or static on television, um, uh, they're trying to uh, parlay their limited understanding of, of stasis uh, to, um, to, to characterization in fiction. Um, but when we're talking about static characters in fiction, static means stationary, okay? It means that it doesn't move. If you've ever been to an air show, uh, sometimes they will have what they call static displays. I once went to an air show and there was, uh, they had on static display a B-2 bomber, which was pretty cool because you could walk around the aircraft, we could walk through the aircraft and look at it and, um, and experience it uh, up close, but it was static right? It wasn't moving. So it's that idea of stasis, of, uh, of static, that is applied to characterization. So it makes sense that a static character is the same sort of person at the end of the story as he or she was at the beginning of the story. They demonstrate zero or very little significant or substantive growth. Okay, so the static character is one that doesn't really change much. Okay, when we meet the character at the beginning, the character uh, is presented or uh, or shown one way, and by the end of the story, uh, that character has not grown any. It's the same. The character is the same. All right. So static characters. <laughs> so don't write a static character as a fuzzy character or an unclear character. All right, one more slide. So the dynamic character is sometimes a character referred to as a, a developing character. Dynamic character is a character that undergoes some type of change. Usually it's a significant one, oftentimes a permanent one, in some aspect of his or her character, his personality, or his or her perspective or outlook outlook on life. So most protagonists will fall into this category. Okay, And again, it comes back to that idea we talked about in, in the presentation on plot. The protagonist experiences conflict. right? And that conflict, as a result of, uh, of meeting that conflict and overcoming the conflict, or maybe even being defeated by the conflict, that character has changed significantly, fundamentally, at his or her core essence, right? And listen, this is why we read fiction. This is why those of us who love literary fiction read fiction or, or love fiction. It's because of the character. And we see that character 
come up against sometimes insurmountable conflicts with other characters, with the environment, or with, again, as we said, some type of internal conflict. And we know that that character has struggled, right? And we know, uh, but, but they've changed. They've grown fundamentally as a result of that conflict. And that's what's satisfying. That's why we, that's why we read, right? Generally speaking, let me just end with this, uh, short stories, the kinds of stories that we're reading this semester, generally only have one dynamic character. They only have one, present one protagonist uh, in, in, the, uh, in, in the story. And there's a reason for that, too. Uh, short stories generally only have one dynamic character because that dynamic character is usually the round character, right? And so, consequently, they have lots of sides to them, a multidimensional character. If a story were populated with numerous dynamic or developing characters, we would simply get lost. We would simply get exhausted and get tired of trying to keep track of, of, of all these various characters going through these significant transformational changes. Does that make sense? So um, your dynamic developing character is usually the protagonist and usually that character has undergone uh, and we have witnessed and observed some kind of substantial change in the character. They're not the same, for better or for worse, okay? So it's not always a positive change. Sometimes it can be a negative change and sometimes those are the most memorable ones, right? Because they present uh, a side of life that we may not, uh, may not make us smile, but we know that somehow the author has revealed to us something true about life and about, uh, about the way we treat each other, about the human condition. And that's what art, uh, at the end of the day, uh, is. It's, uh, it's holding up a mirror for us to see ourselves. Uh, the good and the bad. Okay, so with that uh, uh, rather uh, large dollop of melancholy at the end of our presentation, I'll be quiet and I'll say uh, I hope that the rest of your day is fantastic and I'll see you very, very soon.